you know, dig into the material that we have uh, at, at hand. Um, we are going to learn lots about each other. And my hope is that, you know, this is a smaller group, which excites me. Um, that may sound strange considering there's over 100 people in the room, but, you know, typically if you get above 150, uh, it switches from small group to large group. So we have a small group here, which excites me because a lot of the stuff that we'll be covering, I will need your uh, feedback and input. So I was just listening to some of the conversations um, that were happening uh, before we started here. And something tells me that you're an extroverted bunch, which, <laughs> which I like. Makes my job much easier. So um, we will have some time at the end for question and answers. Um, if you do, uh, as we're going through the material today, if you have something that um, is sticking in your mind, please feel free to shoot up a hand. And if we can cover it uh, during the talk, we'll do that. Uh, but if not, we'll save it towards the end um, and cover it there. So. Whenever I speak, um, I always like to share a little bit about who I am as a person, mostly because when I go to conferences and workshops, I like to know about the person who is standing at the front of the room. So there's a couple ways that I know to do that. And the best way is to tell you about uh, my family, who, um, if I would turn this on, would show up. There we go. That is my, <laughs> that is my lovely family. Um, that is my wife, Carrie. Uh, we have been married for almost seven years. Um, and we have two little ones. Uh, my daughter, Evie, there, who my wife is holding. She just turned one last weekend. And then my son, who is uh, upside down in this picture, Finnegan, he's almost four. And there are a few different pictures of them. Um, yeah, I mean, come on. You can all. <laughs> They're cute. I'll admit it, and there's my daughter, uh, Evie. So they are just a blast um, to be with and to have in our home, and um, you know, not to over-spiritualize things, but I do feel like having children has given me another dimension in terms of my relationship with God and seeing how uh, I relate to them and, and you know, looking through scripture and seeing how God relates to us in that fashion. So they are just a blast. Like I said, we are just so overjoyed to um, be their mom and dad. And so uh, they are at home in Des Moines. My wife texted me. It's it's uh, almost uh, dinner time there, and they're just um, they're just a, a joy to to have in my life. I live here. In case you are wondering where Des Moines is at, <laughs> um, lots of people say, "Isn't that the Potato State?" And I just say, "Yes, it is. It totally is." <laughs> Do we have anyone in here from Iowa? One, two. Born in, Born in Ames. Do you live there now? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> we we could go there. I'll count you. <laughs> yes, it starts with an I. Exactly. We we produce crops that grow from the ground. That's all people seem to remember. Um, so that's where I live, in case you were wondering. And we do have a few claims to fame, uh, Des Moines does, other than being a flyover state and a flyover city. A few of those things I'll share with you right now. The first is the Olympian Sean Johnson is from my hometown. Sean was a medalist in the 2008 Olympics and a Dancing with the Stars champion. <laughs> and um, so I see her every now and again at the Starbucks right by my house. And uh, we've now officially just gotten out of the starstruck phase uh, in Des Moines where she, this poor girl can actually go out and around town and not be hounded for autographs and whatnot. So that's one thing. Uh, we, as we mentioned, we produce a lot of corn. That's, that's no joke. There is a corn field in my backyard. Even though if you were to give me a tractor, I would have zero idea how to use it. Des Moines is like one of the only, um, the Des Moines area is one of the only uh, places in town where you can, or in the state where you can go and find people who have no idea how to actually farm. So we are known for corn and then, of course, the butter cow. Has anyone uh, laid their eyes upon the butter cow? Okay, so we, we have a lot of people in here who've seen the butter cow. It is literally a cow made out of butter um, that is at the Iowa State Fair uh, every year. And people love to go see it. I've been there every year since we moved to Iowa, which was in 1986, to stand there for about 15 seconds awkwardly and stand at about 200 pounds of butter in the shape of a cow. 
So that's my family. That's where I'm from. That's where we live. And I want to share with you a little bit about why I'm standing here before you. What, uh, you know, where my path has kind of led to lead me to talk with um, church communicators and churches and church leaders about uh, how to leverage technology to build God's kingdom. And so for me, that journey starts at this place. This is at uh, Lutheran Church of Hope in Des Moines, Iowa, which now officially, I guess, is the fastest growing uh, ELCA church in the nation, um, which isn't, uh, you know, all, all too terribly exciting, but it does mean that, um, you know, we have a lot of people who are coming in and out of our church. Now, I'm not on staff there anymore, um, but my wife and I still attend there and volunteer there, and part of my responsibility on staff, I started... Um, you know, I was fresh out of college. I graduated, graduated college in 2003 and was looking for something to do. Uh, and so in between waiting tables, I went and volunteered at Hope and eventually started volunteering in the high school ministry and then in the collegiate ministry um, and then found my way into uh, the digital director role. That was my official title. We just made it up. It doesn't mean anything. We just made it up. Um, but essentially what it meant was I was responsible for the online presence of hope. And I should back up a little bit because during this time, so 2003, uh, I was volunteering and, and, and you know, taking on different responsibilities. And then 2006, I felt the call to go uh, to seminary. So I started seminary. Uh, I wasn't married at the time um, and started in 2006. And uh, went through school and actually I didn't want to move. I knew that was one thing I didn't want to do. I loved Des Moines. I wanted to stay in Des Moines. And so I began looking for places that, um, schools that taught their Master of Divinity program or offered it online. And so one of the places that I found was uh, Bethel Seminary. That is actually, that picture was taken right after graduation. Um, and my wife actually made me take that because we paid for a seminary out of pocket, which if you've been through that at all, you know how uh, pricey it can be. Um, so she said, you are getting a picture by that sign, and you're going to jump for joy. So I did. <laughs> but the Bethel experience for me was transformative, and not necessarily in the way that you might think. Yes, I went and learned you know, the traditional um, seminary classes, took those hermeneutics, Greek, Hebrew, uh, you know, these types of things learning how to read the Bible and think critically about Scripture and, you know, uh, historical analysis and these sorts of things. And so that was transformative in one sense. But for me, the bigger learning, um, I, th I think the biggest lesson I took away from seminary was getting about three years of the way in and realizing that I did not want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. And that was... Uh, I would say a, a setback for me, but um, it, I think the right word was uh, it knocked me off my feet, maybe the phrase, uh, to put a phrase to it. Because I had just assumed that I would go through seminary, graduate, be called and ordained, um, and be a parish pastor for the rest of my life. And that wasn't the case. And I remember distinctly what class it was. It was pastoral care. <laughs> 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 it was pastoral care. I was sitting in pastoral care, and we were discussing about, you know, bedside manner and how do you, you know, counsel people who are dying and what does that look like to lead them spiritually through that process. And I realized, like, man, that is a weight that I don't know if I can bear. And so, um, you know, it was about a year before I graduated, and so all throughout this time, my last year of seminary, I'm thinking, like, I, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. So I quit about four different times. And again, my wife was a voice of reason. She said, we have invested a lot of time into this. You are not quitting. You are going to finish. And I'm so glad that um, we made that decision together. Because it showed me a few different things. Number one, being a pastor is hard work. It's really hard work. I mean, I was exposed to situations that I was not prepared for and, and, and situations that I, I think human beings probably never can be truly prepared for. But I realized that, you know, God was shaping me and, and showing me that, you know, there may be a different um, path emerging in front of me. 
So I graduated um, in 2010, and to prove it, they sent us one of these little cards. I don't know why they did this, but I got about 100 of these cards, and you know, to make me feel like I got my money's worth or something like that. So I sent him like, it's like my grandmother, and she's got it framed on her fridge. And it's wild. But anyway, uh, I graduated 2010, and then um, really went through a, a kind of a transformative process at Hope. And it was during this time that I began tr transitioning into our digital ministry. And of course, this was an entirely new area for churches, especially Lutheran churches. I mean, you guys know, being a part of a mainline denomination, how sometimes uh, hard it can be to move the ball forward. And with the ELCA, an ELCA tra <laughs> I love it. Most people don't snicker at that, but I think <laughs> I think if anyone can resonate, you all can resonate with that. So anyway, um, it was hard to move the ball forward in this particular area in church in general, but certainly, like I said, in our neck of the woods and within our denomination. And um, being one of the younger people on staff, I was put in charge naturally of our social media presence. And at the time, that included a Twitter account that no one had ever updated, and a Facebook fan page that was randomly generated by a, a parishioner. And then they said, hey, you guys should probably do something with this because I don't want to look after it. Um, and so I was put in charge of that. And so I began kind of um, looking at, uh, discussing with other leaders across the country and saying, hey, you know, I have friends in different pockets of of the world, and, and some of them were in, were in online internet ministry. And I said, hey, what are you guys doing with your social media? And so we began to talk and chat and think of new ideas. And eventually, I grew our fan page to um, you know, a, a pretty good number. I think it was a couple thousand people. Now, our church at the time was around 9,000 in terms of membership. And I remember our senior pastor, Mike, <laughs> Mike Householder, he said, he wanted nothing to do with social media at the time. Not only was, was apathetic towards it, but actually had like a, a violent opposition towards social media. Um, and so this was weighing on me and I'm thinking to myself, how in the world am I gonna tell him that we have over 2,000 people <laughs> on our fan page? When I knew that this was not something he asked me to do. So. Um, I began, you know, starting conversations and uh, generating a, a lot of buzz and a lot of activity on the fan page. And finally, one day I said, he's either going to find out or I'm going to tell him. So I told him. I said, Mike, you need to look at this um, just because you're going to find out sooner or later. And I want you to hear it from me. So he took a look at it. And instead of going down the direction I thought he was going to, which was basically to say, how dare you get out of my office, he said, there is real ministry happening here. There's ministry happening here. And I'll never forget those words because it sparked a desire deep inside of me that um, I truly believe God has given me this passion and uh, given me a purpose in sharing with people uh, like the folks in this room and all over the, the, the country and really the world of what it means to leverage te technology to build God's kingdom online. And so we continued to, um, you know, work on what it meant to be a church online at Hope. And eventually it led to us launching our online campus, hopeonline.tv. It stands to this day, something I'm very proud about. Um, it's been up for three whole years, but in the digital, you know, spectrum, that is an eternity almost, it feels like. And so hopeonline.tv was launched with the hope of, you know, live streaming our, our weekend services online for people who, for whatever reason, were out of town or, you know, we had a lot of college kids leave our ministry and they would say, we can't find a church here. We, we really miss hope. And so a lot of people started tuning in and uh, now it goes all over the world and all over the, the, the country. But um, it really sparked a passion and a desire in me to look at what is digital ministry? What is online ministry? What does it like, look like for the church to be online? So um, left staff at Hope in 2010, went to work on staff at Monk Development. And uh, again, some of you are familiar with Monk, um, a fantastic organization. I'm actually still working in partnership with them, um, uh, building some uh, materials for them. But 
uh, have now transitioned into focusing much more exclusively on resourcing the church in terms of their online presence, what it means to be the church online. And so uh, I've started a few companies with some friends. One is called Sage Communications. The other is called Some Company. Um, and our sole purpose really is to resource the church to build God's kingdom online. Um, I'll, I'll have a, um, I'm going to uh, build um, a, a page on my website for you guys to have all these notes um, after uh, the conference is done here. So I'll put some links um, to these companies as well. I don't want to dwell too much on it here because we have a lot of ground to cover, but I do want you to know that if, um, if you feel like we're going too fast, I'm going to have uh, a link um, for you guys at the end of our time together so you can have all these notes. Um, I do want to let you know, too, that uh, we have an official hashtag for uh, our sessions here today, and really for the whole conference. That hashtag you can see here on the screen. You can tag me if you want. I'm at Justin Wise. If you don't know what a hashtag is, we'll get there, I promise. Um, but again, this is all for a purpose. You know, a hashtag, if you're not familiar, is a way to kind of tag a conversation on Twitter. And this allows us to stay in discussion with, these, with, with, with each other, with, the, you know, with one another um, throughout our time here. And then also as we go to our hotel rooms tonight, as we're thinking through this material uh, in the next couple days, as you're in workshops, you can include this hashtag and I'll be following it and interacting with all of you on Twitter. So um, that kind of leads us to our, our current moment. You know a little bit about why I'm here, about what my passion area is, about what has led me to this point. But I want to know why you are here. And in some ways, this is a rhetorical question because I've already asked you. Um, if you remember, a lot of you actually, uh, much more than normal, filled out my um, questionnaire. And basically, I like to do that just to get a sense of who you are, uh, you know, as much as a questionnaire can tell you about somebody. I like to know who you are and um, what concerns you have. What your context looks like? What, um, what are you facing? What challenges are you facing in your day-to-day -day life? So I asked the question, um, what is your biggest challenge? We'll get to that here in a little bit. But just in case you were wondering, um, here is kind of a cross-section of who's in the room. And my apologies to the back. Most of you probably can't see the writing here. But uh, most of us are from churches under 500. You know, half the room it looks like are here, uh, just about half the room, are here representing churches under 500. Um, the next largest section, you're here on some sort of, uh, uh, when I was looking through the answers, you're here on some sort of uh, diocese relationship. Um, we have a few folks um, in the 500 to 1,000, and then a smattering of folks uh, that are in churches larger than over 1,000. This just give you, gives you an idea, if you're sitting there wondering, is there anyone else like me? There are, um, and we are a, a room that skews to, again, churches under 500. Next up, um, I ask, what are your uh, biggest concerns uh, in coming to this room today? And again, you guys might not be able to see in the back, uh, but the number one concern in the room was social media. The next biggest concern was basically communications in general, building a strategy. And then the third, which is, which, is, um, which is becoming more and more normal to see this, is Facebook. <laughs> Basically, how do we use Facebook? What do we do with Facebook? So those are some of the concerns uh, in the room. But some of you had answers that I thought I needed to share. Um, some of them were humorous. Some of them, of them were, uh, I think, very revealing in terms of not only the challenges that you all might be facing in terms of the, being an Episcopal church or an Episcopal church communicator, but also what the church at large, and, and these answers are pretty typical wherever I go. Any denomination, age group, um, it doesn't matter. These answers typically kind of surface. So I asked the biggest challenge. <laughs> I, I love showing this, this video. Um, <laughs> If some of you don't know, I, I trigger that too soon. I may have to replay it. In fact, I am going to replay it just because I, I like watching it. <laughs> so, 
in case you're wondering what you're looking at, which would be a very normal question at this point in time, uh, there are videos all over YouTube called the Cinnamon Challenge. Has anyone in the room attempted the Cinnamon Challenge? Yes, there's one in the back. There always is. That away. It is. It's awful. So the cinnamon challenge, the, the premise is you, uh, human beings cannot consume a tablespoon of cinnamon. Uh, and if you try, you will end up looking like this gentleman. Uh, so there, like I said, there's videos of people doing this all over YouTube. Some of them are funny, and some of them just get out of hand. But um, I, ask, I show you that to ask, to set up the next question, which was, what is the biggest challenge that you're facing? Now, this guy's biggest challenge is eating a spoonful of cinnamon. Now, most of you did not put that on the survey, so I do want to reveal some of the answers that you came up with. This person said, my biggest challenge is convincing people in the diocese that they need to keep up with the times where technology and communications are concerned. How many of you can resonate with that? <laughs> We can have rounds of applause. I have no problems with that. Next person said, replacing the known way with risking and overcoming the unknown electronic methods of communication. Educating board members to use 21st century methods of communication. <laughs> can anyone resonate with that? Yeah. Hey, if you guys are going to go with the applause, we can applaud. I'm totally <laughs> cool with that. This next person said, while most parishes do have websites, they are not kept up to date due to the aging population of their parish. <laughs> Anyone? Low resources, high expectations, followed by... <laughs> we can just stop there, that's it. Uh, followed by frustration when difficult priority decisions mean I can't support everyone. Combining monitoring systems for all platforms and unpacking key metrics to ensure greatest impact for audiences. Anybody resonate with that? Next one, getting through gatekeepers, diocese, uh, dioceses. <laughs> How would you pronounce that? Well, there you go. Hey, Lutherans have synods, man, okay? It's much easier to pronounce. Congregation staff uh, to end users in the pews. Anyone? Okay. Uh, next up, older congregation with limited computer knowledge. Knowing how to use social media effectively in ministry. Not enough time to learn new skills. One person shot. And then I did have to include this one because it is my absolute favorite. What is your biggest communication? <laughs> we have a witty bunch here. <laughs> biggest communication challenges, open-ended questions. Does anyone want to fess up to that? Anyone? Okay. I thought that was very, very, very witty. The point uh, remains that, you know, we all get a sense that we're all facing the same challenges. Wherever we're at in the country, regardless of what we're doing, maybe our job titles are all over the map, but we all sense that these are common frustrations, common problems that we're looking to solve. And so my hope um, in our time together is not that we would have answers for these that we can lock down in a formulaic way and take back to our congregations and unpack. Because unfortunately, as we'll see, it doesn't work that way. I cannot give you a one-size-fits-all scenario to have you be effective at all the concerns that we saw on the screen. What I can give you is principles. Principles that will work in just about any context. Principles that have been developed over years, not only through my own work, but through work of some very talented colleagues, people that I've had the good fortune to work with, people at Monk, um, the business partners that I'm working with now, these are things that we know work, and we've seen work in congregations time after time after time. So that's something that I can teach you. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of um, application on your end when you get back home, when you start, sit back at your desk, and you say, let's go to work. Are we all on the same page? Yes, good. Okay, 
Uh, one of my very favorite scripture passages comes from the First Chronicles 13. And I will read this um, just because I enjoy it so much. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men, all these leaders understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. The people in this room are the leaders of the tribes of Issachar. You are the leaders who um, are to go ahead and to scout the land and to see what the best course of action to, is to take. Now, church communicators have it rough. Church communicators have it rough for one reason, because they are usually the ones who are held responsible for communicating the larger vision of the church or the organization. And so when things go right, they don't get the credit. <laughs> when things go wrong, they get the blame. That's almost always how it happens. And the church communicator outside of the senior pastor, I am convinced, is one of the most um, influential positions on a church staff or within an organization. And very rarely do they get the credit for that. Very rarely do church communicators get the credit for that. And I know that after um, I was the executive director for the Center for Church Communication. And so that's all we did all day long was work with church communicators. And you saw that church communicators had the ability um, to craft a message in a way that actually made ministry happen. So the senior pastor gets a lot of credit or you know, whatever you know, particular title that person may have, the senior leader of an organization, a church, typically gets a lot of credit for fashioning that message. But church communicators often are the ones who are responsible for uh, crafting it and putting it forth and making sure that people know about it. So in order to know where we're going, we have to take a look at where we've been. We have to take a look at history. And so I want to unpack for you the history of human communication. I feel like there needs to be like a, like a bumper right there or some music or something, like a sound effect. I need to build that into the presentation. Yeah, angel singing or something like that. Because um, like I said, we are talking about church past. And the title for this talk is Social Church. And like Jake said, I am writing a book. And so a lot of the material that I'm covering today um, is from that book. So you get access to it before. It, it's not even in print yet. It's not even to the editor yet. Um, I have to hand it off at the end of this month, of which I am terrified to do. Um, it's been something I've spent like months of my life working on, and uh, it's yet to be edited. But a lot of the material that we're going to be covering is coming straight from that book. So in February 2014, you're going to say, I have heard this already. I've been there. I've, I know what he's talking about. But again, First Chronicles 13, this isn't so much as to say, hey, let's parse this verb. But it is to say, this is going to be the theme for our time together. We're going to be looking down the road, seeing where we need to go as church communicators, and then taking um, steps to ensure that we're going down that path. It's bumpy, it's scary, but it's the only way forward, and it's a lot of fun. So first we start out with, uh, as an oral culture. We, we, we start out um, as a, a species communicating with one another orally. We speak, we share. We tell stories. Uh, you know, we sit around the campfire and tell tribal histories. This is our origin. This is who we are. This is where we started. It's like the ancient game of telephone, right? Where uh, generations pass down who they are and where they've come from. And they don't write it down. They, they certainly don't broadcast it over radio or television. And they definitely don't tweet it out. But they share it. They communicate it to one another. They speak it to one another. And many of the earliest cultures were an oral-based society. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Neil Postman, he writes in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. He said, you cannot use smoke signals to do philosophy. You can't use smoke signals to do philosophy. And, you know, I would say you can't use smoke signals to do theology. So it's very interesting because as human beings have um, evolved just socially, We've needed to adapt our methods of communicating to uh, encompass more, to encompass a richer sense of who we are and where we're going. Um, you know, back to Postman's quote, you can't use smoke signals to do philosophy. Uh, smoke signals, however, you know, 
uh, effective they are at communicating a simple message, it would be very difficult to, let's say, communicate uh, Descartes' cogito er ergo sum through a smoke signal. You couldn't do it. The, the complexities are too great. And so as a, as a species, we needed to come up with something different, something more vast that could encompass more nuances and a, a bigger sense of who we are. So then we move into the print culture. And of course, I'm skipping over you know, decades and centuries of our history here. But um, like I said, we do have a lot of ground to cover. And the printing press, uh, or, or the print culture, or the written culture, I guess you could say, really um, took shape uh, after the uh, printing press was invented uh, by Johann Gu Gutenberg. And the printing press brought advancements in science and increased literacy rates. It changed the power structure of information management. And that's something that we'll see in our, in our uh, talk here this afternoon, is that communication is almost always has a, an element of power to it. So those who own the methods of communication typically are the ones who are the most powerful. And so what we're seeing now in the transition that we're seeing in moving into a digital era of communication, the power is being dispersed again evenly. Certainly not equally, but it's being dispersed more evenly. But with the printing press, there was a lot of um, machine, machinery involved. So if you owned a printing press, you owned the power. You had the ability to print a message, and you had the ability to edit that message in one way, shape, or form. If you didn't like what someone had brought to you to print and to disperse, you could say, no, I don't want to print that and they'd have to go find somebody else. But owning a printing press meant that you owned power. But more important, uh, the printing press changed the way that we viewed our world. Now, after the invention of the printing press, there was an explosion of printed materials that we had access to. And because of this, being literate became imperative. And so again, the, the, the wealthy, the powerful, almost always could correlate to being literate. The poor, the downtrodden, were almost always illiterate. It was a power uh, struggle if there ever was one. Now, the past 500 plus years, we've spent the majority of our formative years you know, using books and other reading materials as a basis for how we understand our world. It's as the basis of how we understand our faith even. We talk a lot about you know, the Bible being God's written word. And this has certainly had impacts on people of faith in our uh, faith organizations. So we moved from an oral-based culture to a print culture into a broadcast culture. Now this is where things get interesting because for the first time in human history, human beings had the ability to communicate one message to many people simultaneously. So we could broadcast a single message at a single point to a lot of people simultaneously. Now, it's true you could get that, that sort of exposure with print, but certainly not as fast. And so one of my favorite um, examples of this is, uh, you can see this in the background actually, this is Orson Welles and his War of the Worlds adaptation. And I've studied a little bit about this for the book, and I don't know that there's a better example of broadcast technology than this, and it's sheer power. Now, um, Orson Welles was, a, was an actor, and so he had a flair for the dramatic, and he said, what if we took War of the Worlds and, uh, you know, kind of morphed it into this mock radio broadcast? Of course, you know, people would never think it's real, so what if we do that? What would, it, what would happen? What would it look like? So he, he, he kind of uh, does the work of adapting the book into a radio broadcast. And in October 1938, the War of the Worlds went out as a mock uh, emergency kind of radio broadcast into people's homes. And I went out through the CBS radio network, which was in millions of homes at the time. And so here you had, if you're not familiar, War of the Worlds, you know, it's basically the story of, of Martians landing on the planet Earth and what that would look like and what it would, um, you know, what it would feel like. And so he gets on there and, and, you know, has this vivid description of what the aliens look like. And he's, you can YouTube the audio uh, for it. It's really kind of transfixing. And I, I have to put myself in people's shoes back then and just think of how terrifying that would be. That would be so scary. Because here, broadcast technology had really been, become a friend to a lot of people. And that sounds strange, 
but actually there are studies now that show television can actually cure loneliness, believe it or not. Um, and there, there's whole wild brain scans on that, but anyway. Um, television became, or radio was a trusted source, a trusted friend, a trusted advisor. And so the public at this time was somewhat naive towards the power of broadcast technology. And so you can imagine what happened when an emergency alert system broadcast type thing goes out and people hear that Martians have landed on the planet Earth. People were freaking out, running into the streets, screaming, packing their cars, driving to who knows where, headed for the hills, so to speak. And of course, it was all a hoax. And I don't know that it was necessarily, in reading interviews with Orson Welles, I don't know that it was a hoax as much as it was satire, but I don't think he understood the power that he had standing behind that microphone. But again, it goes to show what broadcast technology was possible uh, what was possible through it. And so we were in the broadcast mode for the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century. <laughs> and then we switched into, of course, what we're here to talk about today, and that's the digital era. Digital era of human communication. And we'll get into depth in this uh, tomorrow and again on Friday. But needless to say, the magnitude of this shift is something that we feel each and every day. We sense it, we know it, our churches and the people in our churches are changing faster than we can adapt. And it's because the way that we communicate with one another is changing. So if broadcast era was one to many, digital era is many to many. Meaning many different messages going to many different people at many different times. And again, I spoke briefly on it, but the digital era shifts the power balance. It basically says anybody with a computer and an internet connection can have their voice heard. Now, it may not be heard by very many people, but that's not the point. The point is that we, all of us in this room most likely, if we have a phone in our pocket or a computer at home or a computer even in this room, have the power to broadcast a message, to share and to interact with people all over the world. And this is changing everything. It's changing everything. And a lot of people who study this stuff are saying, this is going to be 10 times bigger than the shift that uh, happened when the printing press was introduced. And I believe it. I see its effects each and every day. When you see uh, gov oppressive governments topple because of a th silly thing called Twitter, when you see, um, you know, for my own examples, when online education allows me to provide uh, it allows me to earn a Master of Divinity from a school in St. Paul while I'm at home in Des Moines, Iowa. That's shifting things, that's disrupting things. When commerce has basically changed overnight and we can buy anything that we want, uh, and you know, studies are now showing that the most trusted um, recommendations in terms of purchasing is from our friends. Well, how do we get those recommendations? Through social networks. And brands are becoming you know, very aware of this, and so they're targeting a lot of their marketing. Um, Seth Godin calls it the permission marketing, opt-in marketing. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But as goes our communication methods, so go, goes the culture. And I want to share with you um, a, a diagram here that basically shows kind of our progression as a history in terms of how we're structured as a society. And all of these relate very closely to our modes and methods of communication. Um, so in this first, you may not be able to see this in the back, and again, I'll have these slides available to you. In this first section here, it's a hunter and gatherer uh, way of structuring society. And again, this relates very closely to the oral-based culture that we talked about earlier. Next step is the early civilizations. This is going into a print culture. Um, basically, you can even see it in the way that it's structured here, where there's one point of reference and then uh, the printing press, you know, if you want to think about it that way, there's one point of reference of the printing press and it goes out to all these different people and those people um, can disperse the message how they see fit. Then you move into the Industrial Revolution and this is where we spent, you know, the broadcast era really took root. And when you dig into it, broadcast technology in some ways was invented to um, keep the Industrial Revolution culture going. Broadcast, it was said, uh, was invented 
television shows were invented for the commercials, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So broadcast in some ways actually feeds the machine of the Industrial Revolution, selling people things that they don't need in order to keep the, uh, the, the, you know, the factory lines going. So we're transitioning out of this. And we are now here. We are in a hybrid model. And the digital era of communication is just starting to take root and we're starting to feel the changes and it's changing the way that we relate to each other in society. And so pretty soon we'll move into a completely networked civilization where things are, are happening and, and you know, there's networked and, and relationships forming instantaneously and all over the map. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we are starting to see these effects of this hybrid model um, and some of which we'll go into a little bit later. But I want to share some stats to kind of back this up. Um, there is a fantastic study. I encourage you all to read it each and every year. It's called, um, uh, it's from Arbitron. It's from the folks at Arbitron. It's the Edison Research Project. Um, they do a fantastic study each and every year. It's called the Infinite Dial. But they ask the question, hey, what would you rather have, internet or another medium? So like radio, television, newspaper, these types of things. So they're basically asking you to choose internet or something else. And so you can see the progression here. 2002, 20% of folks said, I'd rather have the internet than any other medium form. 2007, 33%. 2012, 46% said that they would rather have uh, the internet other than any other medium. It's the most essential medium in their life. And of course, this number will continue to grow up and up and up. And in fact, I bet if you were to take that stat now, 2013, it would be, it would be at or above 50%. So more people than not are saying, we must have the internet. We'll give up television, we'll give up radio, we'll give up newspaper, but don't take away our internet. This is fascinating to me. And it really shows the progression of where we're headed and what we as church communicators need to be mindful of. These people behind this percentage, these percentages, those are the folks who are in our churches and in our organizations. These are our constituents. This is how they communicate. And so we need to be aware of that. This will kind of blow your mind. One in five, one in every five page views on the internet happens on facebook.com. Now, I had this formatted a different way and it just was too big to really wrap my mind around. When you break it down like that, so like if you look at five different web pages, chances are that one of them is going to be checking, you know, the, the latest, cutest pictures from your friends or something like that, or liking someone's status update. One in five page views on the web happens on Facebook.com. That is fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> there are 200 trillion text messages sent per day. It's a lot of zeros. 200 trillion text messages received every day in America, just in this country. Now, anyone want to guess? I have the number here. Anyone want to guess the average number of texts sent by an American teen each month? <laughs> Are you cheating? No, you, mu you must have teenagers. I, I do. Stay up for Sunday. <laughs> Close enough. The actual number is 3,400. 3,400, average number of texts sent by an American teen each month. Now, that's a 556% increase in two years. So that, that stat is from 2012. It's a 556% increase from 2010. I mean, that, the amount of data and information being sent in those texts is staggering. Uh, again, it, it, and so those of us who have teenagers or know teenagers, we resonate with these messages, don't we? In fact, um, this one's kind of heady, but I show it here just to give you a perspective of where we're at and where things are going in terms of um, data usage, so mobile data usage. So every time you take your mobile phone out and you check your email, you're using data, right? We all kind of get this and know this. This is showing global mobile data traffic. So here we are in 2013, and this is where they're projecting the numbers to go by 2015. Now, what's interesting about this is they're measuring petabytes. Petabytes. Anyone know how many giga gigabytes are in a petabyte? I heard someone say something. A million. Yes, just over a million. 
So there's a million gigabytes in one petabyte. And so here, 2013, we're wimpy in comparison to 2015. So we're just, uh, just a shade under 3,500 petabytes. That is astounding amounts of data. And it's only going to increase exponentially. In fact, a good friend of mine, Cynthia Ware, says within a generation or two, uh, the world will move from a primary analog augmented existence to a digitally dependent one. Say so that again, within a generation or two, the world will move from a primarily analog augmented existence to a digitally dependent one. And I feel this. <laughs> I, I know this to be true in my own life, and maybe some of you do too, where I see uh, my father-in-law is a New York native and um, is I Irish Catholic. He has eight brothers and sisters and is about as no-nonsense as you can get. <laughs> and he said, I bet you can't go 24 hours without using your cell phone. I was like... Whatever. Of course, I didn't say that to him because he'd probably be, beat me up or something like that. But um, I said, okay, I'll take your challenge. And I haven't been able to tell him this yet, but I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. And in some ways, that terrifies me. And I actually talk a little bit about this in the book of how we're becoming this, you know, we're becoming the matrix. As those of you who have seen the matrix, you know what I'm talking about. We're becoming plugged in. So, so, so many of us want to like, Unplug. In fact, I was just reading an article where there are retreat centers popping up all over the U.S. that deal with digital detox. That's what they call it, digital detox retreats, where people go and they're like forced to give up their cell phone for three to four days. And the, and the stories of people coming out of this, I mean, it'll just astound you. And, and um, studies are showing that when people use social networks, it excretes the same chemicals in the brain as uh, someone on cocaine. I mean, that just blows my mind. It, excretes, it has the same brain chemistry as someone who's high. The dopamine and all, this, all these sorts of things. And so there, in some ways, there is a real um, fear of becoming addicted to our devices. But anyhow, um, Cynthia is a brilliant mind, a brilliant thinker. She is now at um, uh, Pepperdine uh, over in Malibu. But she uh, talks a lot about Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that technological advances take half as long as the previous advance. So put that another way, every time there's an advancement in technology, it takes half as long as the previous advancement. So um, for instance, the cost of a, a, a gigabyte of data, let's say if you have a, a thumb drive or a jump drive, whatever you call it, maybe it's on your keychain or in your backpack. You know, thumb drive, when I was in college in 2000, my roommate had a computer that had two gigabytes of data on it. And we thought, what will you ever put on two gigabytes of data? What will you ever fill your hard drive up with? You could put Word docs and MP3s, stuff. <laughs> but now, you know, two gigabytes fits in our pocket, and then some. And so the, 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 just the cost, the cost and our ability to shrink what two gigabytes looks like is happening twice as fast. I mean, that was in 2000. And now you can get jump drives that are 16, 32, 64 gigabytes. And 2000 is not that long ago. It's 13 years ago. And so Moore's Law states that it's just going to keep going faster and faster and faster. And uh, people will get smarter and smarter and be able to make more and more advancements. And so the stuff that we're all dealing with now, I guess I'm telling you this because the, the advancements and the adaptations that we're having to make now, that pace is only going to quicken. And of course, eventually it'll go, get to a point where it's not possible at all to, to keep up, not even a little bit. And so then you talk about a whole other sorts of things like meta computing and nanotechnology, but we don't want to talk about that here. Um, so while we are on the subject of technology, I do want to ask, and if we have a few brave souls, I'll take three of them. I'd love to hear your definition of technology. Anyone want to give just kind of their off the top of their head definition of technology? And if not, that's okay. I know, yeah. 
Good. Great. Tool, a means to an end. Great. Very simple. Good. All right, we'll move on. And I'll give you my definition of technology. It's similar to what you were saying. It's anything which extends our reach. Anything which, which extends our reach. And now that kind of takes it out of the context of what we're discussing here today, but that's on purpose. Because we use technology. Technology is all over our lives. It's everywhere. It's in this room about 100 times over. Um, the glasses I'm wearing on my face, this is actually a picture of them. They're from Warby Parker. Any other Warby Parker fans in the room? Yeah, okay. Um, they're a fantastic organization, warbyparker.com. Every time you buy a pair, they give a pair to somebody in need. Uh, but they're just really nice guys, too. Anyway, um, eyeglasses are a technology in the sense that they have intended and unintended, unintended consequences. Quite obviously, uh, you know, eyeglasses extend our reach in terms of what we can see. So the intended consequences of, of eyeglasses are... Um, you know, allowing us to see better or more clearly, 2020 maybe even. Now the unintended consequences are if they're not fitted properly, we're gonna get headaches. If our prescription is not continuously updated, it might actually make our eyes worse. There's a span of about three years in high school where I refused to wear glasses because I thought they were like so uncool and you know, you're going through those teenage years and um, so I didn't wear them at all. I needed to wear them, I didn't wear them and uh, my prescription got intensely worse as the years went by. Now, let's take a look at another example. Light bulbs, or light in general. Manufactured light is what I'm getting at. Intended consequences. What are some intended consequences of light fixtures or light bulbs? Shout them out. Seeing without the sun. Seeing without the sun, great. Longer hours to work. Hours to work. <laughs> now, some may say that's unintended, but hey, whatever. <laughs> Carbon emissions? Carbon emissions. Okay, great. That, now that, would that fit into unintended, maybe? Yeah, that would be a great unintended consequence, for sure. Carbon emissions, yes. What about one more intended consequence? Yeah, in the back. Say it again. Staying up late. Staying up late. Okay. <laughs> Safety. Good. Great. Now, it's interesting because I put those in different categories. Like, I put staying up late as an unintended consequence. Because, you know, before lights came on the scene, we're watching Downton Abbey right now. Any Downton Abbey fans? <clears throat> we just watched the episode where um, they're talking about telephones and how crazy telephones are. But anyway, back to lights, you know, one of the unintended consequences is that we stay up later. We don't have the natural biorhythms of the sun rising and setting. So in some ways we can set our own schedule. Whereas before, before lights, they of course used candles and other sorts of light emitting tools. But generally speaking, you got up when the sun got up and you went to bed when the sun went down. Unintended consequence is that we can change that and go to bed whenever we want uh, because of light. Automobile, intended, extends the distance we're able to travel in the same amount of time. Uh, in some way, I would not be able to be here with you all today if it wasn't for the automobile. That's an intended consequence. Now, the automobile gets a bad rap because there are tons of unintended consequences. And I'm sure Henry Ford didn't sit in, you know, in his office and think, how can I make a 2,000 pound bullet? <laughs> Where you deal with unintended consequences like drunk drivers, traffic accidents, these sorts of things. Uh, pollution, um, you know, smog, emissions, these are all unintended consequences. Fossil fuel depletion, um, you know, carjackings. I mean, I'm sure Henry Ford was not thinking, man, I'm gonna have to, people are gonna steal other people's cars at gunpoint. I probably shouldn't do that. No, it's an unintended consequence of the automobile. We'll do a few more here. Um, running shoes, or the shoe in general, it allows us to travel over rough terrain without hurting our feet. Uh, it ex extends our capacity to travel by foot. But what's interesting is that the unintended consequences of shoes are that they're actually changing the shape of our feet. Uh, and there, there's a, a very famous picture, and, and I didn't have time to, to capture it um, uh, on the plane today, but uh, they, were, they show the progression of people's feet actually changing. And, and they, they're starting to look like the shoes that they put them in. 
uh, which is just wild. And they, and they do like a, like a cross section between these native tribes in Africa who never wear shoes and then businessmen. And you can actually see the, the, the foot forming around the shoe. So there's a big movement now. I run every now and again. I'm a runner. And there's a big movement now of barefoot running. But there's intended consequences and unintended consequences of our technology. And where I want to kind of go from here is in terms of our writing instruments. There's intended consequences and unintended consequences of our technology. It allows ideas to travel farther than they would have uh, before in an oral-based culture. Let's take writing, for instance. Now, the unintended consequences is that ideas have a longer shelf life. And that can be both a good thing or a bad thing. Um, for better or for worse, there's a loss of communal storytelling nature and our unintended consequences. Now, I want to share with you um, a few more things before uh, our time is done here today. But you know, the, the church has always been at the forefront of technology. And that may sound strange, but I want to show you why and how that is. The church has always been... Um, quick to embrace new methods of communication. In fact, the early church was built on technology. The technology of the time, of course, being writing, more specifically, Paul's letters. Paul, of course, Paul the Apostle wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Here we have uh, La Conversion de Saint Paul by Luca G uh, Giordano. And now we must first realize that the early church was built on the back of technology. This is how the word spread, both figurative, figuratively and literally. So when Paul was sitting in a prison somewhere, his letters were going throughout the region and changing people's spiritual realities. So in some mysterious way, God was using these letters, using technology to build his kingdom. And for us, it seems strange to say that letter writing is a, is a technology, a cutting edge technology. But in fact, at one time, it was. And Christians, again, Paul was um, certainly not the first one to embrace letter writing, but was certainly comfortable with the fact that, you know, in some way, shape, or form, he was sharing a God moment in these letters, and that this packaged God moment was going around the region, and the Holy Spirit, in some way, was using that to uh, turn people to Jesus. Fascinating to think about and think through. Um, next up, we have, uh, again, going back to the printing press. And, and can you guys hear that as well? Are they out? There's actually there's people outside washing the windows. We need a new view, a new reality, right? Okay. So the church and the printing press, of course, has a very storied history. Uh, you know, if we think of the most obvious example, at least for me anyway, I think of Martin Luther. And Luther's insistence on translating, not only translating the Bible into a language that people could understand, but then using the printing press, again, the cutting edge technology of the day, uh, and, 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 and dispensing that idea, dispersing the word to people throughout uh, his region in Germany, but also, again, throughout the world. Now, this picture here um, is the room at the Warburg Castle where Luther translated the New Testament uh, into German. Now, if you ever go there, if you've been there, you would know this. The, there's an original first version of the translation in that glass case on the desk, which I find thrilling. I would love to go there and see that. But when Luther talked about the printing press, um, he called it the highest act of God's grace. Highest act of God's grace because of the way that scripture was able to be sent through this printing press and get into the hands of all people, not just clergy, not just the ones who had the power, not just the ones who were educated and literate. Um, you know, the, the, his Bible was written in a way that it could be read aloud, and people even who couldn't read could then understand God's word. That's a huge power flip. That's a huge power play. And again, Christians have always been eager to embrace technology. Of course, we all know Luther and his 95 theses, and he never in intended for those to be printed, but people took a look at it, read it, and said, man, more people have to read this stuff. It's similar to when we see something on our Facebook news feed and we share it. 
right? Other people took a look at what Luther wrote and said, man, we can't keep this to ourselves. Other people need to hear this and read this and see this. So they sent it through the printing press, to which Luther was very upset about. He never intended that to be read anywhere else than in that immediate region. But of course, it sparked these things combined to spark the Protestant Reformation, of which we're still feeling those effects today. And again, I believe the digital era that we're transitioning into has way more significance and way more at stake than, um, than the printing press. So uh, Gutenberg said this. I want to read to you a quote from the inventor of the printing press, Johann Gutenberg. He said, Religious truth is imprisoned in a small number of manuscripts, which confine instead of spread this public treasure. Let us break the seed which binds these holy things. Let us give wings to the truth. Through it, God will spread his word. A spring of pure truth shall flow from like a new star. It shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light heretofore unknown to shine among men. That's a guy who gets technology. He's saying, listen, God's word cannot be confined to these manuscripts. More people need to read it. More people need to see it. More people need to embrace it for themselves. And this printing press is going to help them do that. And I get so excited about this because I see people all across the country who are beginning, it's beginning to click that we all have, you know, printing presses in our hands, on our desktops, in our pockets. The internet as a whole is the new printing press and the implications are staggering. Now, um, lastly here, we'll close with uh, the radio uh, or broadcast technology. You know, again, technology is anything that extends our reach as, uh, as humans. Um, anybody know what this picture is from? Being, being good mainliners, this, this, scare, this stuff scares us. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Amy Simple McPherson was a, uh, the woman who started the Foursquare denomination, but she was fearless in terms of technology. Um, she, said, she said this in the Bridal Call magazine in July of 1923. She said, these are the days of invention, the days when the impossible has become possible, days more favorable than any that ever have been known for the preaching of the blessed gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now the crowning blessing, the golden opportunity, the most miraculous conveyance for the message has come, the radio, she says. The radio. And in fact, radio has a Christian past, a Christian history. 60 of the first 709 radio licenses issued were issued to Christian organizations. Uh, every day, the Far East Broadcasting Company spreads the gospel in 150 languages to people all over Southeast Asia using radio technology. So we have roots in uh, you know, print. We have roots in radio. We certainly have roots in TV. Uh, and as we'll see, there are Christians all over, over the world putting their roots down in digital communication. And that's what tomorrow will be about and Friday will be about as well. Um, I want to share this quote with you from the one, the only, Tina Fey. <laughs> I read her, um, her autobiography, um, what's it called? Bossy Pants. I can, the only thing I can ever remember about that book is the cover image. It's so haunting. Um, it's terrifying. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's her obviously photoshopped onto this man's body. <laughs> eh, whatever, you have to go uh, look it up online. But she, she said this in, in Bossy Pants, and it really stuck with me um, because I think it has applications for how we, uh, we approach technology in our churches, right? Like when I first started in, um, looking into this stuff in 2003, 2004, many leaders... Many leaders were quick to dismiss the web. And I'm just going to use it a, a broad term like that. Quick to dismiss digital communications, quick to dismiss the internet, quick to dismiss social media. Basically saying, it's a fad, it'll pass. And I think Ms. Fay nails it here. Our culture, our society, our world has experienced 
a revolution and a transformation that we will not go back from. We will not go back. We will not back up the bus and say, you know what, we should really kind of give up all this stuff that we've grown accustomed to and go back to the way things were. It's not going to happen. And so church leaders, church communicators, the people in this room and folks I talk with all across the country have a choice to ignore it or embrace it. That's really only the only two options at this point is to ignore it or embrace it. Ignore this um, technological shift or embrace it and build God's kingdom with the technology that's in front of us. So the last thing I want to share with you, um, of course, we all know this well, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. We are having to um, do ministry in new ways. Think of ministry in new ways. Think of our churches in new ways, uh, many of which we'll see t- uh, tomorrow and Friday. And again, my, my goal here is to not overwhelm you or um, discourage you, but to open the reality up that sets before us in terms of our, our possibility, our potential, the way that we can advance the kingdom using technology. Um, our time's coming to a close here. It is 4 o'clock, and I want to make sure we have time to get to where we need. I'll, I can th- Let's do two questions real quick, um, if there are any. Otherwise, I'll close this in prayer, and we can move on. Any questions? This is more, this is the the most uh, theory-based talk that we have. So we'll get into some more practical how-tos tomorrow and Friday. So I I would imagine there'll be more questions then. Good. Okay, well, let's, oh, yeah, we have one here. I just wanted to make more of an observation. Sure. Um, That one technology does not necessarily, I mean, sometimes it's good to see a different technology, right? You know, bigger and better radios, bigger and better cars, bigger, bigger and better computers. But, for example, a, um, and I'm uh, you know, a boomer and you know, beyond, and so um, I grew up with books, magazines, so forth. They're still very much an important part of yes. my, my culture. Yes. I'm also embracing the new tech. So yes. um, I don't know if it's an age or generation thing, because uh, I don't know what the young kids do, if they're reading papers or not, but I don't think think it's necessarily so that you reject one and you depend on it very much. So what what would you say about that in in terms of the generational marketing, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on that there are, um, uh, uh, somebody mentioned it earlier, there's digital natives and digital immigrants, right? Um, it, It boils down to certainly what you're comfortable with. And it, you know, the, the uh, history that I was showing, you know, no, one method never completely eradicates the other, right? Obviously, we're still communicating with each other, telling stories by speaking to one another. We're still writing, still printing, still have broadcast technology. It's what has prominence and where the trends in culture and society is shifting towards in terms of dominance. And, um, so, you know, simply put, uh, there's no reason why anyone has to say, well, we're going we're gonna to stop doing these things. I think it's all a matter of focus and what's going to get the most focus and attention. And not only that, but um, studying the trends. And I want to get a lot more into the trends in terms of just who's using uh, digital communication. Because the trend is showing that, you know, one of the fastest growing age groups for, uh, let's take Facebook, for instance, is women aged 45 to 54. And your guess is as to why. Grandkids, grandbabies. They gotta see their grandbabies. So again, it's, it's um, not that one supersedes the other, but there is something to be said about doing some cultural translation, saying how do we be a church in this society, in this culture? Thank you, Justin. Yep.